Okay, tonight's presentation is Artemis, NASA's new rocket by Dean Michalicek. Tonight, Dean will discuss how Artemis was manufactured and the engines used on SLS, the Space Launch System. He will also discuss the comparison to Saturn V, along with the European Space Administration introduction to the service module from ESA, the Orion spacecraft, and the difference between Apollo and Orion. Dean Mikulajcik is an American astronomer born in the Midwest. He became interested in space and astronomy at the dawn of the space age in the 1960s. He was fortunate enough to have great teachers in all levels of his education growing up. He did research on quasars and solar astronomy at Northwestern University and the University of Chicago Yerkes Observatory. He received his MS in astrophysics with a concentration on solar astronomy and worked on NASA's Mir program to Mars. Please welcome Dean Kalaychuk. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back here again. Um, he gave the intro so you know what I am and who I am and what I did. Okay, uh, I want to say right away, just to start off, that this is a hat that my wife got me. She goes, oh, look, it's your birthday. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's nice, but that's, that's when NASA started. <laughs> she goes, um, oh, you just bursted my balloon. And I go, like the one China sent over? <laughs> yeah, and she goes, ooh. -hoo. I go, well, thank you for the hat. <laughs> nice hat. You know, to see what she does and stuff. Yeah, so we're going to do Artemis today. Fantastic rocket. A um, little bit taller than uh, uh, Saturn V. Saturn V was about 350 feet tall. Artemis is about 322 feet tall. Much, much more powerful. Just to give you an idea how powerful Artemis is, okay, it's all together with the solid rockets and the engines, and I'll get into a little bit more detail, it's 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. Okay, to put that in perspective, that's 246,000 train engines. Okay, and it'll kind of put it in perspective for you. So we're kind of talking about how Artemis is going to go on the missions that we have. Okay, we have one mission already completed. And uh, Artemis 1 was a total success. Uh, it has used shuttle equipment, the RS-25 engines, which there are four of them, two solid rockets, again, which there are two. However, the solid rockets have, a, uh, have an extra section. So uh, it's a five-segmented booster instead of what the shuttle used, which was a four-segmented booster. Okay, increases the horsepower on it, but it still burns for about uh, two minutes and six seconds. Okay, so it's absolutely an incredible, incredible uh, space vehicle. Uh, the first launch, of course, was last year. Uh, we had several delays, as you know, because we had hydrogen leaks going in. The oxygen worked okay. Well, what is the first element on the periodic table? Hydrogen. It's the smallest molecule, okay? That's why we have leaks. It's very difficult to use any type of Teflon connection, any type of sealer, any type of anything to try and do it. So NASA came up with a deal of how to do this. So there's fast fill for the hydrogen, and there's, there's slow fill for the hydrogen tank, and there's also, um, they can stop it if they want. Okay, the problem with the hydrogen that we use is it's, more, it's 450 degrees below zero, not to mention how small the molecule is, being the first on a periodic table. So when we go through all this in the filling, NASA found out, because I believe there was about, uh, we, we tried like three times, but we couldn't get it right, because all of the fuel was leaking out and it was, just became too dangerous. Uh, NASA has monitors where it attaches for the, for the tank, and they're right here. This is where the fuel tank goes in. This long pipe that you see here is from the oxygen tank, which is right here. That holds 196,000 gallons of liquid oxygen, okay, and we hold 535,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen. One of the questions I get all the time is, why is it not even? 
Well, the liquid oxygen is, if you want to think about it, is kind of like Aunt Jemima syrup. <laughs> Okay, it's not really a liquid, it's more like a molasses, okay? So it's more dense, it takes longer to go through. So it actually works out the same, having the same type of fuel mixture down by the RS-25 engine, which there are four of them. Okay, so Artemis works out really good in that idea. So why did we decide to do the solid rockets also? <clears throat> well, we don't have the F-1 engines. F1 engines were on the Saturn V. If we were able to keep the Saturn V after, because the last Saturn V that actually flew was the Skylab space station in 1973. If we were able to keep that, those engines, we would be able to finish the ISS in five flights, as opposed to 30 flights from the shuttle because the shuttle cargo bay is 65 feet by 30 feet. We've been able to do that. And I think the segments would have been larger. Look at the size of Skylab. Okay, it was the entire third stage of the Saturn V rocket. So, I guess we should go back and do that. So, Artemis's trajectory that we're going to do it is going to be a little different than Apollo. Um, if you look at any Apollo map that is used all the time, that where our landing sites are, where are they? Equatorial region. Why? Well, first time going there. We want to make sure we have communication. We want to make sure that we're talking to them all the time. What is the delay from the Earth to the Moon? One and a third seconds. Light speed. Okay. So, so this time we're going to the South Pole. When Artemis II takes off, which is November 24th, 2024, Mark that in your calendar. Um, I'm sure there may be some delays, but we'll see. NASA's pretty good at that. So what we'll do is that we'll take off, which is number one, and we'll take it all the way over, and we'll get into orbit, and then when we get to the part three, everybody knows about TLI. NASA's great at acronyms, Translunar Injection. Okay, we fire the third stage. It's absolutely incredible. It worked the first time. Everything went out there. The difference between this flight and an Apollo lunar flight is we are going to go 3,000 miles beyond the moon. Okay. Now, Orion went out there the first time, and that's the farthest any man-rated spacecraft has ever gone. Okay, we've had, you know, right now we've just done updates for Voyager 1 and 2, believe it or not, 45 years old. And uh, we got more power to it because we changed some science instruments in the power. So Voyager 1 and 2 has more power. In fact, it takes 13 hours for that signal to get to the Voyagers at the speed of light. That's the distance. So, okay, so we're going to do this figure eight. So... This figure eight should be remembered by a lot of people who followed Apollo, because Apollo 8 was the first one with Jim Lovell, William Anders, to go all the way around and do the figure eight for Apollo 8 around the moon. Now that mission was not designated to go around the moon. We got some intel that the Russians were gonna go there first. So of course NASA asked the crew, Borman, Lovell, and Anders, are you capable of doing this? Okay, this is like three weeks before launch. Okay, we've had many successful Saturn launches, so yeah, let's do it. So and the rest is history. <clears throat> you got that great, great photograph of the Earth with the moon, with the uh, moon and the Earth rise. It's fantastic. So if you noticed here, there's something just a little bit different about the Orion spacecraft. This time we have solar panels on it. Okay, <clears throat> solar panels have been be become the state of the art. We actually have Juno spacecraft, <clears throat> which is out by Jupiter now, that has solar panels. Because they are so sensitive, so well built, and so responsive to sunlight, it can produce a lot of power. Um, it also eliminated one problem that we had with the American service module that we all know of from Apollo 13. Okay, the fuel cell. The shuttles had fuel cells, but they were updated, of course, since the Apollo era, and we also knew exactly 
how to produce that. What does, this, what does a fuel cell do? Well, it uses hydrogen and oxygen, and what is the byproduct of that? Water. water. Astronauts drinking water, of course, it's purified a bit before they can use it. And it's the same thing with the RS-25 engines that NASA uses on the Artemis booster. <clears throat> okay, the big steam cloud that you see is nothing but steam, but it's 3,000 degree steam. Okay, to test them. So we decided to go a little international with Artemis now, which is fantastic. We brought in the European Space Agency, and they had produced the service module. And with that service module came the four solar panels that are used. Now these panels can be stretched outwards, they can go in front, they can go in back, and they can swivel just to follow the sun. And by all means, all of the computations and everything that the ESA did with NASA and the cooperation, the voltage was much better than what was predicted. That's one reason why. So when they knew that was going to happen, they attached like 20 GoPros on Orion, even at the end of the solar panel, so we can see all the photos that it can take. <clears throat> so theoretically, an Apollo... Apollo uh, or um, Artemis 1 be making the orbit around there. So what is different than just landing on the south pole of the moon? Well, we're not doing a direct landing like we did with Apollo. Okay, we, we carried the LEM, the lunar excursion module, all the way to the surface and we did all of that precisely. Apollo 11 with Neil Armstrong, Apollo 12 with Pete Conrad, and the SOGO Apollo 13 would have been Jim Level, Apollo 14 was Alan Shepard. So we were going to just bring it down in their areas and the science got more and more involved as we got more and more comfortable of landing on the moon. Well, as of now, we really don't know what kind of lander we're going to use. And that kind of scares me. Okay, um, the first company that put money in or, a, or a, a, a type of debate or they wanted to go through what kind of lander was SpaceX. Well, if you saw the SpaceX launch, <coughs> it doesn't look too promising to have a lander by 2025, 26. Okay, that's the issue. <coughs> so, actual photograph, which is just beautiful, of the spacecraft. If you compare it to Saturn V, which there really isn't anything except because uh, it was all internal with Saturn V. As mentioned before, you have from the oxygen tank all the way down to the RS-25 and the oxygen tank down the 17 inch, so that's a 17 inch pipe that's pumping oxygen down to the RS-25 engines. <clears throat> Just remarkable. Now, Saturn V, do people remember what Saturn V looks like? Do you remember, do you remember the black parts on the first stage <clears throat> and the second stage? It was pretty cool watching. Everybody thought that that was for decoration. That is used to make sure that Apollo went through the roll program. That's what these were for. <clears throat> now we can actually measure that with a laser to make sure it's on the correct trajectory. It works out really well. A lot of people also in other lectures and when they see it is that they think this is the tie downs for Artemis, keeping it on the launch pad. Oxygen and hydrogen inlets to fill the tanks, that's all. <coughs> so it's doing the same thing the shuttle did. There's four explosive bolts here, four explosive bolts there. That's the only thing that's holding Artemis to the launch pad. Okay. We have some arms up here that encompass it, but it doesn't hold it only because of damage. You don't want to put too much on there, okay? Even though it is aluminum and titanium, it <coughs> works out really well. Here's the heart of the whole matter. The Orion spacecraft and the European Space Agency's service module. So how do we know to integrate this? 724 pages of diagrams between NASA and ESA to integrate that. 
And as you can see, it, it's just a beautiful spacecraft. But this is without the solar panels now. So these red parts that you see here, especially these, okay, are veneer thrusters. Because in space, you have pitch, you have roll, and you have yaw. So you can control the spacecraft in any type of direction and, and move it around. Now it also does one thing that Apollo had to do also. It just doesn't fly to the moon. It rotates as it's flying. Why do you think we rotate the spacecraft? So it's like rotisserie chicken. Rotisserie <laughs> chicken. You don't want to cook one side of, the art of, the, of uh, Orion. Okay, not that it would really matter, but it's interesting to have that though. It's, it's pretty cool to doing it, but that is the reason. Okay, even heating, because remember, 250 degrees above zero. On the dark side, 250, 260 degrees below zero. Okay, so the service module, going back to using reused shuttle parts, houses the OMS engines that were on the shuttle, orbital maneuvering engines, okay? So we're using those over again, save some money, you know. We have them, we know they worked, went through 135 flights of the shuttle and they were very accurate, worked all the time, there was never an issue, let's reuse them. <coughs> so they were completely built inside the service module. So now this is something that's really cool. This is the Michu plant down in Mississippi. I, I was there a couple times. The best thing about that is this, this is Boeing's new machine, which they call it the Great Welder, everything in blue. Now in Saturn's times, all the welding was done by hand. After it was done by hand, it was followed up by x-rays to make sure that a lot of it was even, even after grinding it down. This process from Boeing that we can do is called stir welding. Do we have any welders here that know anything about it? Stir welding is really cool. You know, if you look at a welder, you know, they've got the glass and they got the sparks flying. There's not many sparks on a stir welder. Okay, the stir welder has a top which is only about three inches in diameter. And it's right in the middle of both of the tanks, this part and this part, when they put it together. When they put it together, the stir welder is rotating and going around very slowly. It's actually mixing the molecules from both parts, the bottom part, the top part, to the side part, okay? And when it does that, it produces heat on the other side, which helps the molecules move together. Yes? That's friction welding, right? Yes, friction welding. They call it stir because it turns. Same thing. And it's, it's just an amazing. So why did I bring this up? Well, imagine how good those welders were that had to work on the Apollo. I mean, it's, it's amazing when you look at the technologies from the early 60s to what we can do now. And the other reason why I mention it now is that we are now building the SLS Space Launch System for Artemis IV. They already have one, two, and th well, one is gone already, but two, three, and four, two and three are already built. Two is almost finished because that's going to bring our record crew to the uh, south pole of the moon. But the stir welding, listening to this thing and working is just amazing. And then looking up at it, you obviously have the swirls, but once it's all worked out, it looks like one piece. So, and they still x-ray it, by the way, to make sure that there isn't any issues. So, out to the pad. So, this little vehicle that we have here just won an award. Does anybody know what the award is? Guinness Book of World Records. Not for the slowest vehicle, but the heaviest vehicle that moves, going in at four tons. Uh, actually, it's, it's heavier than that, 400 tons, I think it weighs. Each of these links in the treads is one ton, 2,000 pounds. Below it, you have the stone gravel that it takes into the pad. Now, NASA has pad 39B. 
If you remember from the Apollo eras and the Saturn eras, NASA had a 39A and 39B. Well, SpaceX owns 39A now. That's why we can get a, a Dragon to fly and a, a, a Falcon, Falcon Heavy, which just took off a couple days ago. Um, that's why you can use that. They can completely use that pad for SpaceX. So, uh, and 39B is for NASA. This is what NASA was meant to be, okay? Give, there was a lot of criticism in the beginning that here's what we're doing, okay? Commercial crew, even the astronauts said, even Gene Cernan said, commercial crew is, is not the way to go. It, it's got to be the, the, the U.S. government. But look at what Elon has done, and we don't have to get into too much politics about this, but he doesn't have the red tape. We're not paying for it. Okay, and he's got Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, and Starship, and reusability. Those two boosters that were used on his uh, Falcon Heavy the other day, each flew about 13 times. Absolutely amazing. So how does he get the customers? Okay, this is the difference between having commercial and then having uh, NASA as part of the government to do it. Uh, the commercial issue is, is really well defined because Elon pays for it. Okay, it's his rocket, he can do what he wants with it, he can pay for it, and he can change it. Not to mention that he's a, a brilliant engineer to begin with, obviously, from what he has gone through. For us, that's our rocket. We paid for that, the whole thing, you know, top to bottom and stuff, and that's how we have to use it. So I taught a class at Triton once about, it's called Space Science too. It was government science. Okay, what is the difference between a capitalistic society trying to get a space program as opposed to a communistic country trying to get something? Well, we vote on things. The Chinese can do what they want. The Russians can do what they want, okay, without any input. But as with the tortoise and the hare, us being the hare, or the tortoise rather, we won that fight. Okay. So Artemis is just completely redone here. This thing has a top speed of one and a half miles an hour. It gets 540 feet per gallon. <laughs> yeah, so next time you look at your gas gauge, think about that and don't swear <laughs> because they're paying a lot for that. Anyway, about this crushed gravel, it's river rock. You know, the type that you can skim across. You know, it's perfect stuff. Unfortunately, it gets very hot. So if you've seen pictures, even when the shuttle was going out, there is a fire truck in front of it that's spraying water on the rock because of the compression. The river rock on both of these sides where the treads are is six feet thick of river rock. Okay, so it's just not a path with stone and sand to take you all the way there. So there's a lot of science and engineering behind it. Um, it's obviously updated for the larger weight because if they are larger uh, solid rocket boosters and a larger booster to hold all of that. Yes? you know where the rocks come from? Probably right off Titusville. Oh. Okay. And then... Uh, I think a lot of it also came from uh, uh, Malibu, came from Malibu also, they were trucked in. Um, do you remember NASA's real funny looking spacecraft called the Super Guppy? It brought all the rocks in. So you can imagine what that looked like and stuff. But yeah, this is a historic moment for this whole setup here. Now remember, between the years and when we were building this, all the engineering had to be in place. All of this had to be built. Uh, we do have two of these. We're going to have two structures to take it. So why are we going to have two structures? Well, one, this is called SLS Block 1. Okay, this is a manned rated launch vehicle. Block 2, which will be SLS also, will eliminate this part and go up a little bit higher and won't have the escape tower on it for cargo. The incredible amount of cargo that SLS can take, 540 tons in one flight. 
Think about that for a minute. This rocket has to go seven miles per second to go in orbit, and you're pushing 540 tons at seven miles a second? Aye. It, it's amazing that it does that. So, and that's why we're doing it, because it's going to be a rocket for everything that we do. Now, Werner von Braun built Saturn V to go to Mars. Okay, but we all know Apollo ended in Apollo 17. 18, 19 are canceled. 18, 19, and 20 were canceled. Where are those boosters? They're outside Johnson Space Center, they're outside Kennedy Space Center, and they're outside Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Okay, everything from Apollo 18, 19, and 20 was already bought and paid for, and the crew was already trained. See, that irks me. Okay, and it should too, because we paid for it to be an exhibit. So the next time you visit any of these facilities, hey, I paid for that and you didn't fly it. I should get in free. <laughs> okay, of course it doesn't work, but it's worth a try. Yes, incredible. So we make it out to the uh, pad from the vehicle assembly building in about six and a half hours. That's how long it takes to get there. It's the first time all the doors on the vehicle assembly building went to the top because we didn't have to do that with the shuttle because it wasn't as tall. All right, now for the spacecraft itself. Absolutely, ridiculously impressive. What do you notice about the outside of this spacecraft that Apollo did not have? Tiles? Tiles, exactly we decided to use the tiles. So what is the difference? We know the hazards of the tiles because we know, unfortunately, what happened with Columbia because of the, the foam. It wasn't a tile that ended up hitting the left wing. It was a piece of foam that hit that left wing. Okay. So we decided to use tiles because there is nothing above that that can damage the tiles. As with the shuttle, there was, there was situations with foam above the shuttle that obviously caused the demise of Columbia. We didn't have to worry about it here. Plus the insulation, okay? This capsule can hold seven astronauts. Apollo, three, okay? Apollo came in at approximately 17,500 miles per hour on re-entry coming from the moon. Orion will be coming in in over 25,000 miles an hour. Okay, so it's bigger. It's gonna be hotter. That's another reason why we decided to use the tiles. But the nice thing is, is we have access, you know, to all these places we can get at. Now, Everybody's got stereos. I was going to ask you if you wanted me to use the speaker, but I got such a big mouth. I hope you can hear me. We'll go that route. This is an acoustic test. Now, when you drive your car and you lose your muffler, you know how annoying it is with that very, very deep sound. Well, that's what we have to do here. We're not going to put anything through that without testing it. The tiles are completely complete. The parachutes fake parachutes are actually, weight-wise was equal, is actually right on the top. Uh, windows were covered only because of acoustics, but everything inside. These are nothing more than speakers, okay? And it's put in one of the largest uh, vacuum chambers that NASA has at Ames Research Center in California. We blasted it for 14 hours at all different hertz, from where I mentioned way, way down low to where you can feel your car vibrate like crazy to the very, very high to a point where you can pierce and break windows, break glasses and stuff. And uh, absolutely no damage at all. So the engineering was incredible on Orion. <clears throat> Beautiful picture taken from Orion from one of the GoPros. So you can see one of the attachments here, these are little veneer rockets, as I mentioned before. 
This is the OMS engine from the shuttle that was used. These are new Veneer engines also. But there's a backup to the backup. If the OMS didn't work on the service module from European, you had eight of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on the other ones. That can be used to return your astronauts if you need it, and also to change orbits. The initial design for those veneers are to change orbits, but it can be used as a backup if there's an issue with the engine on the service module. Now, as mentioned before, these are high-tech, very, very high-tech uh, types of solar cells that are used. Okay, and that's fantastic. Yes, sir? I'm sorry. You said that it was in a vacuum chamber uh, and they were testing it for sound? Right. Sound does not travel in a vacuum. Exactly. So what would happen if it didn't? What happened if there was something on the outside that broke? So they tested regardless of what was going to happen. So regardless, any route that they went through. But you're absolutely correct, will not travel. That's why it's kind of hard watching Star Wars with all the stuff. It's just, you know, it's great. But yeah, these are very fantastic. You've got uh, four of these and gimbling back and forth. So yeah, it worked out great. So good pictures. I wish we got pictures like this with Apollo, but we didn't have that. Another great shot. Now this is actually 3,000 miles past the moon. This is when they're gonna whip around and head towards Earth. So, and this is the farthest that a man-rated spacecraft has gone. And one of the pictures from the GoPro, okay, black and white, but it's good. You can kind of see the outline of Africa right here. So, pretty cool. All right, here's the business end of it. Very, very cool. All the engines. You got two, four, six, eight of the engines I just mentioned. You got veneer thrusters and you've got the OMS that's put in. Everything that is capped is basically <clears throat> removed before flight. And that's what's important. There have been some things that were left on for flight, but nothing that would uh, uh, endanger the astronauts. In that, and in fact, one of the things that NASA got so upset with is when John Young brought a corned beef sandwich in on his Gemini flight. Okay, and they're worried about that because of the flakes of the you know floating, you know, get clog up the filters or whatever. But had to have his corned beef sandwich. So this is over in uh, in Europe, uh, putting everything together, and it was absolutely flawless. Uh, works so well. Um, they were very happy. So European Space Agency will be monitoring the whole service module as Apollo would have when we had the service module as Johnson Space Center would in the early days of Apollo. So they will monitor their equipment while we monitor ours and we keep each other updated. This is Orion coming back from the test. Um, took some of the tiles off, but you can see that some, because if you look at the previous picture, you know, it had this nice sheen on it that they used. Well, that was burned away in the re-entry. Uh, the heat shield withstood the 25,000 miles per hour re-entry, had a little bit more damage than they anticipated. But uh, they're working on that still, and that should be taken care of before Apollo is I don't know exactly what system they're going to use to change the manufacturing, but it's pretty much like what Apollo is. It's very labor intensive. So this is inside. We had three dummies inside. Uh, one of the German dummies was Hilga. Okay, she was an anatomically correct woman. Okay. Anything from G-forces, temperature, stresses, even the stress on the belts that they locked them down would, would show. Okay, 1,200 sensors on all, all three of these dummies that were inside. And there's one dummy in there that we should all recognize. You know what that is? Snoopy. That's Snoopy. What was Snoopy used for? 
Zero G. Zero G indicator. Yeah. yeah. So once he starts floating, we're in space. So I guess at this point I could mention the difference between the cockpit of Orion and the cockpit of Dragon. Okay. As you know, and if you've seen some of the Dragon launches and the televised views of Dragon, is that a lot of it is touch screen. Okay. It has some backup to it that you can flick some switches and if you look carefully at the dragon it's underneath the touch screens okay this is mostly touch screen but it also has backup also to use which is fantastic um, guess how much the wiring weighed in Apollo because there was no touch screen in Apollo okay 246 pounds of wires. How much the wiring inside Orion? 46 pounds. Okay. Which means that 200 pounds, what can you do with that 200 pounds? Add more cargo, of course. Yeah. Right. Yeah, more cargo. I like it. Yeah, it's perfect. Double step. Yes. So I just want to take a poll here. This is the old or the, the newer NASA compared to the older meatball. Do you know why we went back to the meatball? And it was after Challenger? The reason why is because uh, Griffin was our, was our uh, CEO, our NASA administrator. Um, he said, we're going to go back to the meatball because that's NASA 1. Okay, now coming from Marshall Space Flight Center at the point that I was there, they were still building and still evaluating space station habitats. Okay, the problem with that and spending is that one part of NASA was not communicating with another part. So behind some of these buildings at Marshall, you had maybe six, seven, eight of these modules that were built. Okay, now I understand that you can build them, put them to the side, see if they work, but if they don't live up to it, so you're spending the money trying to do this. Okay, so Griffin went back to NASA One, one company, one place you produce it and do it. Saved NASA something like six and a half billion dollars the first year he was in office for doing that. Okay. Now NASA-1 is very important because if we had NASA-1, Challenger would have not have happened. Okay? The problem with Challenger and everybody knew was the, was the uh, O-rings. Okay? NASA's criteria to launch shuttles was nothing below 55 degrees. The temperature at launch for, for Challenger was 37. Okay? They knew of the problem with the O-rings since 1977, 11 years, 10, 11 years after it was discovered. But it never made it up the chain. In other words, take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat. Okay, not a good idea. That's what NASA One is. And that's when Elon Musk decided when he flew Falcon Heavy to incorporate the old one and the new one to pay homage, which I thought was a good idea. Not only that, it looks pretty cool. So, all right, Artemis on the pad. This piece you see right here had foam on it when it was the shuttle era. <clears throat> That's the piece that broke off during flight and hit the left wing of Columbia and put a gash in it which the astronauts had no idea. There's no rear view mirrors on the shuttle. You can't look at the leading edges of the, of the wings. You have no idea. Though it doesn't make a difference now because there's no manned vehicle below that, this is carbon-carbon. So we learned and moved on from there. Okay. Again, the shuttle or the uh, SLS is attached by eight explosive bolts. It's nothing you can buy at your local Ace Hardware. Okay, these are about four inches in diameter. Okay, they're about 14 inches long and they have 
a slit through the center of it with a cap. And right in the middle of the slit are explosive charges. And when it's T0, explosive charges go, it releases Artemis, and it's on its way. Same thing we did with the shuttle. As mentioned before, all of these are to track and to make sure it does its role program. Yes? So then that means the engines will be at full thrust uh, when those bolts blow. We right? only fire we only fire the command to the solid rockets when the RS-25 engines are at full throttle. Correct. Yes. Good point. So here's the old or the newer NASA logo and I mean up here is the other NASA logo. As mentioned before, Elon Musk did the same thing. Okay, so this was a beautiful flight. So did anybody see Starship take off? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thirty three Raptor engines. Yeah. Okay. Burns liquid, oxygen, and uh, methane. So if it took off at night, it would have this beautiful blue glow to it, because methane glows blue when it's when it's excited. It would look really nice. A lot of damage, I'm sure you've all heard. Okay. <clears throat> we had some damage from Artemis One. The one thing is, is that we had, the elevator doors were imploded. The ones that the astronauts are going to take down here up to Artemis. So we kind of lost those doors. 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust is going to do something. Okay. So, but besides pad damage at the bottom, not too much. The difference is we have a flame trench. <clears throat> Starship had a piece of concrete underneath it. Why? Because you got 30 Raptor engines in a circular fashion. Only the centers can gimbal and steer it. There's no way you can put anything underneath that and divert it. Okay, so you're getting a full force of 11.5 million pounds of thrust from that vehicle right on the concrete. Um, I don't think they anticipated that, that type of damage. So it came down perfectly. Do you recognize these? You saw them on Apollo. Do you know what they're used for? Upright the ship. Upright the ship. Just in case we land on choppy waters. Okay, they will inflate and they will right the spacecraft. Okay, so it actually looks pretty good after the first flight. You know, very, very nice and stuff. So, and then the launch which was flawless. And being a software engineer and doing the software, software for Spirit and Opportunity, you know, we ended up with, to make Spirit to go from one point to another point during a day was about 11,000 about 11, lines of programming just for one day. Of course, we can change it you know, during the day for another mission to go someplace else. But it also had a type of AI on it, of AI on it also. It knew when to stop if it was in danger. Okay. The software that is located, you know, right in the center ring of Artemis is absolutely incredible computer power. Okay, compared to what we had with Saturn V, which worked flawlessly also. Uh, but as we all know and we've probably heard too, the power of the computer is probably 10 times more on your watch than it was on Apollo. Okay, and this was absolutely flawless. Okay, now to my part. When I got to Marshall Space, Liner, uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, one of my first tasks was to work on the Block 1 RS-25 RS engines. This is the RS-25 engine controller, which kind of makes sense. You got everything going in it. Okay, it determines the speed of the flow of hydrogen and oxygen, the temperature of that, the consistency of that, okay, the flow rate, and everything else is controlled just from that little box. It's about the size of a microwave. Okay, very important. Some of the shuttle missions we had to uh, abort the load before, or abort the launch before we took off because readings were kind of inconsistent. 
but the shuttle and SLS are designed where you can get a man up there and replace that without taking it back to the vehicle assembly building. Okay. So that's, that's very nice to know. <clears throat> Beautiful engines. We have 16 of them left over from the shuttle. $7.1 million a piece. Okay. We have another four that Aerojet Rockendyne are making right now. Okay. Um, they are upgraded to fit SLS. The shuttle engines ran at 104% of rated thrust. These, with the upgrades and some 3D printed parts, run at 109% of rated thrust, much higher, and re ran it to 109 on Artemis. We're testing it, we have to, okay? When Elon Musk launched his Starship, it was only 90% thrust. And that's the damage it did at 90% thrust. Okay, so we ran these exquisite engines built, um, absolutely incredible. These little devices here, there are two of them. Okay, the other one is on the other side. They're the turbo pumps. Now I got a pool at home, okay, 20,000 gallons, okay. These Hydrogen turbo pumps can empty my pool in 20 seconds. That's how fast the fuel is pumped to the throat. Yes, sir. I know these engines are unfortunately going to wind up in the ocean, but how many times did the show reuse its engines? Uh, each one is different. The ones that were on the first Artemis, uh, I want to say one of them was used 16 times. Wow. Uh, yeah, the other one was used about 12. Uh, they didn't put any new ones on it because they're not completed yet. And then 10 times and 12 times. <clears throat> so the fact they're going to yeah. wind up in the ocean kind of makes me want to cry. Well, it does. It does. Yeah, we cannot, we cannot salvage these. And it's too bad. Um, we don't have a system to bring them back. Yes? So once you start them, though, and you've gone through your fuel, or if you still had fuel left over, could you restart them again, right? Uh, these engines do not restart. They don't restart. No. Once they light um, them, they're gone. That's right. Uh, the ones that I had mentioned before that the shuttle used, the OMS pods, yeah. that uses combustible fuels that when you mix it together will produce the explosion and the thrust. Hypergolic. And they're, yeah. right, hypergolic fuels. So they can shut them off via valves. Oh. Well, these will continually run. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I agree with you. Just watching that magnificence of engineering just plop in the ocean. Um, but you have to remember, when this stuff goes in the ocean, it helps the, hab the habitat. <laughs> okay? Seriously, it does, because there were, there were environmental studies that were done, you know, with uh, the submarines going down there to see exactly what is encompassing <clears throat> these boosters and stuff. Solid rockets might be a difference, because that's aluminum perchlorate, kind of like your Estes rockets. You used to launch when you were a kid, you know, um, you can still get them too. Um, yeah, that's basically what it is, okay. So yeah, these are a marvel of engineering. So as I mentioned before, 3,000 degrees exhaust. What keeps these from not melting? Titanium the fuel. The fuel. Pretty cool idea. This isn't close enough, but kind of here you can see veins. And that's what all of these little areas are for that come in. It's not only for structure, but they circulate the minus 450 degree hydrogen in and out of these little tubes, kind of like your radiator in your car, to cool the engine nozzles. Yes? So that control box that you worked on, where is it on this picture? Can you see in here? Yeah, right on the other side. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're all on the other side. Okay. Uh, yeah, so ingenious idea. F1 engines in the 60s that were used on the Saturn, same concept, okay? In fact, there was one shuttle flight that I remember because they had beautiful views of the shuttle going up and you can look into the throats of the RS-25 engines. One of them had a white little thing inside the engine. That was a broken type of uh, area that was there. So one of those tubes had broke and leaking fuel into the throat, and it was burning as the exhaust was coming out. So yeah, they're a marvel of engineering. So we got twenty, we got twenty, uh, 
four more on the line that we're building up until Artemis IV, and then we'll decide. Um, there was always a, a concern of how often we're going to launch Artemis. Okay. Right now it's coming down to about once a year. Okay. And the block, the, the second block, block two Artemis, which can carry all that weight, uh, will probably launch twice a year, depending on what we do. Okay. Now Gateway, it's going to be our replacement space station, not for Earth, but it's for the moon. Okay, we're going to use the moon as a launching pad to go to Mars in the future. Why? Seven and a half miles per second to get out of the Earth's atmosphere with all that tonnage. Two and a half miles per second on the moon. Not that we're building it on the moon, but it's easier to get it to the moon and then to Mars doing that. So there's the back end of, of uh, SLS. Your RS-25 engines right there. Now if we kept the F-1 engines, we wouldn't need the solid rocket boosters. Um, if we kept 18, 19, and 20 of Apollo, we would probably already be on Mars. Um, if we kept Saturn V, we would only need five flights for the space station. It would be much roomier than what we have now because the third stage of the Saturn V was pretty roomy. If you remember the pictures from Skylab, of the amazing room in there. So this, again, is, is the back-ended issue. Beautiful. Now, the testing of these engines are continually going on in Mississippi. Okay, they test them considerably, back and forth, over and over and over again. They test them for eight and a half minutes, 500 seconds because that's how long it takes to get to orbit. So you kept on saying about if we kept it, we could, why didn't we? Public wasn't interested. And did we lose the information that we couldn't just If you them? translate the information to blueprints of Saturn V, I would have to say yes. And they couldn't go back to where there's another one and no i mean we have the f1s here. you know we've got we've got 16 of them, or uh, we've got 12 of them you know but they're on the spacecrafts that are all over the country you know um they burned liquid hydrogen and kerosene bigger kick you know artemis liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen good kick but not as much that's why we need the srbs so but yeah, here they are being stacked, uh, stacked right on top of the mobile launcher. And see these little rings here, the black ones? We didn't have that on the launches up until Challenger. Do you know what these are used for? Those are heaters. They definitely keep the O-rings above 70 degrees, no matter what the weather is. So if you look at STS-1, <clears throat> two, three, four, five, it was all solid white. And we knew <clears throat> of the problem back then. But, yep. Now, these are pretty heavy. You know, we test these in Utah. You know, it's five segmented, so, uh, and they're flawless rockets. <clears throat> What's the problem with solid rockets compared to the RS-25 liquid engine? Can't shut them off. Can't, Can't shut them off. off. Once they're lit, they're going. Okay. Kind of nice rendering of what it is. This was the problem of the hydrogen leak. <clears throat> now, for some reason, I thought about this. And your, your hydrogen tank goes to about here. Your oxygen tank is about up here. So you're putting fuel in, and you're filling it up from the bottom, which means the more fuel you put in, the more weight you're putting down, I would think, on these flanges. Might cause an issue for fueling. Saturn was filled from the midsection and down. We never heard of a fuel leaking problem with Saturn. 
I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but just from the weight average and how you fill it might have something to do with it. But they fixed it. And how did they fix it? Still leaked a little, but how did they fix it? There's a fast fill and a slow fill. Okay, they filled it fast, started leaking, slow fill, still leaking, they stopped it. Warmed up everything, started doing it again. So that's what we're going to use for Artemis II. Somebody had a question? Yeah. Can they uh, <coughs> use the uh, fuel, empty fuel tanks? Because the, the, the fuel tanks go up, but they don't, how, how long do they stay in orbit? Or do they? Oh, no. I, my, my point with that is that the fill valve for the hydrogen tank on SLS is at the bottom. So as you're filling it, the weight is still pressing down. No, what I'm saying okay. is like how you were mentioned earlier, like how they use uh, the third stage for Skylab. Right. I, I, and kind of going back in <laughs> yeah, your okay. talk here. So I'm saying, could you use the fuel tank for that uh, in that sense somehow? Well, that was a good idea because they wanted to use the external tank from the shuttle yeah. to keep it in orbit. That didn't go anywhere. No. Okay. So. Basically, this has two liquid stages and one solid propellant. So the first stage are the RS-25s and the solid rockets. Okay. So and the launch is pretty incredible. That's a nice rendering. Couldn't get a camera that close anyway. So any questions on anything that I had just talked about for Artemis? Yes. Yeah. Um, getting back to the F1 engines, I mean, it just seems to me that why not rebuild those? Then you won't need the side boosters. You don't have to deal with liquid hydrogen. Um, it seemed like it'd be a cost savings <coughs> in the long run. Well, and you get better efficiency. I, I that's correct. Understand. I and I can I can clear that up for you very very shortly. Here is that, <coughs> unfortunately, <coughs> politics comes in. Okay. SRBs are tested in Utah. Senators, representatives want. So there's your SRBs. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Saturn, I, I don't know why, and it was always sad that we didn't continue and the public interest was there. Remember, everybody was watching Apollo 11. We had a million less viewers for Apollo 12. On Apollo 13, and Jim Level did his all of his interviews and the and the tour of the spaceships. They didn't even broadcast it live. That's the issues. So, well, I thank you guys for having me out again, and maybe I'll come up with something different that you might all be interested in. Okay. Thanks.